Part 11, Cosmic Thought Power. In the concluding paragraphs of the preceding section we called your attention to the fact that in this book we have presented to you the practical principles of thought power, and the practical effective methods of applying those principles, without attaching thereto any particular metaphysical theory or hypothesis seeking to explain the phenomena in question. In this way we have sought to confine this particular phase of the instruction to the plane of scientific psychology instead of endeavoring to tie it to any particular body of metaphysical teaching or form of transcendental speculation. But, notwithstanding this expressed purpose and our endeavor to adhere strictly to it, we feel that we would leave incomplete our consideration of the subject of thought power were we to withhold any mention of the well-established scientific fact that in the cosmos as a whole, and in every part of it, there is in strong evidence the operation of a cosmic principle of thought power serving to give shape and form, character and quality, to the material things and activities which serve as the outer aspect of that wonderful totality of phenomena which we know as the world of nature. There was a time when any discussion of this subject would inevitably lead to an abstruse metaphysical discussion, or at least a technical philosophical argument. But modern scientific thought in its philosophical phase has made it possible for one now to consider this particular subject without wandering from the field of scientific investigation, and without invading the field of speculative philosophy or metaphysics. In view of the facts just stated, we feel that we should not fail to present to your attention, and for your consideration, at least the general outlines of what scientific philosophy is now holding to be true concerning the presence and activity in the cosmos of what may be styled cosmic thought power. In the old materialistic concept, the cosmos or world of nature, was pictured as a mechanism operated by purely mechanical laws. In this view, life, mind and will were regarded as derivative products of matter and mechanical laws though just how these were derived from a principle or substance in which they were not eminent was not explained. This old view is rapidly passing away, and is being succeeded by a far more rational, reasonable and so illa satisfying conception, meeting the strict requirements of both logical reasoning and intuition. In this new view of practical philosophy and advanced science the cosmos, or world of nature, is seen to be animated, energized, and inspired by life and livingness. The universe is conceived as being alive in every part, and in its totality. Instead of being a dead world moved by lifeless forces, or a world half dead and half alive, it is now seen to be all alive. The spontaneous action seen to be manifested by all natural things is held to be a characteristic sign of life and livingness. We do not purpose entering at this place into a detailed statement of this modern scientific conception of a living universe. We have considered this phase of our instruction quite fully and completely in that volume of this series of books entitled Spiritual Power, and do not deem it proper to repeat this portion of the instruction in the present book. Those who feel attracted to this wonderful teaching of modern scientific philosophy are referred to the book just mentioned. A careful study of that work will open a new world of thought to many who have heretofore realized but dimly the great body of truth which constitutes the subject a matter of that portion of our general instruction. We have referred to the conception of the living universe at this point, in the above several paragraphs merely because the presence and activity of cosmic thought power are explainable only by that conception. There can be no thought power without mind there can be no mind without life. Cosmic thought power is inconceivable except as manifested by cosmic mind and cosmic mind is necessarily a phase or element of the presence and power of cosmic life or livingness. Looking at it from another angle, we see that it is likewise true that a living universe must manifest its livingness in at least some degree of cosmic will and cosmic thought power and as might be expected, we find evidences of such manifestations on all sides, when we examine closely the activities of nature. The will power of the living universe is manifested in spontaneity, that attribute of all natural things. Spontaneity means all activity which springs from the nature of the acting thing and which does not arise from a push or pull from some other thing external to itself. All spontaneous action is a manifestation of a power which, in ourselves, we know directly as will. Philosophy and science are now in practical agreement upon the basic axiom that all power, at the last, is will power. That energy which moves all nature, and from which all natural activity proceeds, is explainable only as will power. All things have will power and all things regarded as a totality or whole system, 
are seen to be under the control and direction of one will the cosmic will of the living universe. Further thought along these lines enables one to see that if there is a cosmic livingness manifesting cosmic will, then it is reasonable to conjecture that this cosmic will must proceed in the direction indicated by cosmic thought or ideation this being the way in which the individual will proceed to action. The ancient hermetic axiom, as above, so below as within, so without as in great, so in small, so frequently cited by us in this instruction, applies here as in all other cases. Strict analogical reasoning brings the judgment that the cosmic will, as well as the individual will, proceeds according to the direction of mind and thought. An examination of the processes of nature tends to support and substantiate the conclusion reached by the analogical reasoning just mentioned. Everything in nature is seen to proceed according to law in order nothing is left to chance. Chance, correctly defined, is merely a term indicating unperceived or unknown causes not causelessness. The universe is governed by law, and that law is clearly a law of pure logical procedure. There is a because for every event, as well as a cause everything happens because of certain things. Such a because is a reason and such a reason is explainable only under the hypothesis of an operative cosmic law of logical procedure and a law of logical procedure without cosmic mind and thought is unthinkable. That constant and continuous creation which is perceived to be manifested in the world of nature that world which we know as the cosmos is explainable and understandable only upon the theory and general hypothesis that the creative process is essentially a mental process. Everywhere in nature, from the development and growth of an acorn to the creation and evolution of a solar system, we see the presence of, first, an inner image, pattern, mold or design, and second, the materialization in objective form of that idea, pattern or design. There is always, first the inner ideative pattern, and, second, the outer material form. From the formation of the crystal to the growth and development of the human body, these two respective stages of creation are found present. Ideation always precedes materialization. Materialization is impossible without precedent ideation. This idea of ideative creation in the cosmos, and in man's individual life, is developed fully in that volume of this series entitled Creative Power, to which we feel justified in referring you in case this particular phase of the subject specially interests you. In that book we have illustrated a certain point of our instruction by a quotation from Edward Carpenter, which we feel warranted in also introducing at this point, so forcibly does it bring out the idea which we have just been considering. Carpenter says, there is now a disposition to posit the mental world as nearer the basis of existence than is the material world and to look upon material phenomena rather as the outcome and expression of the mental. In observing our own thoughts and actions and bodily forms coming into existence, we seem to come upon something which we may call a law of nature, just as much as gravitation or any other law the law, namely, that within ourselves there is a continued movement outwards, from feeling toward thought, and then to action from the inner to the outer from the vague to the definite from the emotional to the practical from the world of dreams to the world of actual things and what we call reality. We may fairly conclude that the same progress may be witnessed both in our waking thoughts and in our dreams namely, a continual abolition and birth going on within us, and an evolution out of mendest of forms which are the expression and images of underlying feelings that these forms, at first vague and undetermined in outline, rapidly gather definition and clearness and materiality, and press forward toward expression in the outer world. And we may fairly ask whether we are not here within our own minds witnessing what is really taking place everywhere and at all times in other persons as well as in ourselves, and in the great life which underlies and is the visible universe. Thought power You may say that there is no evidence that man ever produces a particle of matter out of himself and I will admit that this is so, but there is plenty of evidence that he produces shapes and forms and if he produces shapes and forms, that is all we need. For, what matter is in the abstract no one has the least experience and knowledge. All that we know is that the things we see are shapes and forms of what we call matter, and if, as is possible and indeed probable, matter is of the same stuff as mind only seen and envisaged from the opposite side then the shapes and forms of the actual world are the shapes and forms of mind, thus projected for us mutually to witness and to understand. We are not here trying to convert you to the idea that all is mind. In fact, we do not hold to such an idea ourselves, 
and have no intention of trying to preach a doctrine which we do not ourselves accept. In our book of this series entitled Spiritual Power, we advance the teaching that there exists two cosmic principles, viz., the positive principle of spiritual essence and power, and the negative principle of material substance. We hold that the cosmic processes result from the action of spirit upon matter, and the reaction arising therefrom. The point we are trying to bring before your attention, here and now, is merely this, mental power and energy work changes in material substance. This principle is true not only in the cosmos as a whole, but also in the individual's own world which exists on all sides of him, and which, at least to a great extent, he creates, builds up and maintains by the character and quality of his thoughts by his thought power, in fact, if you once grasp this general truth, you will be able to see just how, and to some extent, just why thought power creates for the individual the world on all sides of him. You may here feel tempted to say to us, this is all very interesting, no doubt but what has it to do with the subject of the practical employment of thought power as taught in this book? We hasten to answer that it has a very important connection with that subject a connection which you will carefully note, if you are wise if you will carefully follow us in these concluding pages of the book, you will realize just what is this important connection? and why we have introduced this additional phase of the instruction here at the close of this book on thought power. A difference as marked as that between the two poles of anything is here discovered between the two respective mental attitudes manifested by various persons undertaking to apply consciously and deliberately the forces of thought power or radio mentalism. On the one hand, there is that class of persons who regard thought power as a form of force somewhat apart and separate from the forces of nature in general something partaking of the character of the supernatural rather than the natural. On the other hand, there is that class of persons who recognize and realize that thought power is essentially a force of nature a subtle and fine force, it is true, but still strictly a natural power. The persons of this first class are able to apply the forces and energies of thought power with more or less effect and with greater or less success, according to the degree of effectiveness employed by them in their respective methods of calling forth and directing these forces. But, at the best, they are never able fully to enter into contact with the great body of cosmic thought power which is ever operative on all sides of them, and thus to call to their aid the subtle forces and potent energies inherent in such power. The persons of the second class, on the contrary, enter more or less into this contact or relationship, by reason of their consciousness that the individual thought power is but a focal point or center of manifestation in the great cosmic thought power, and that the power of the latter may be drawn into the individual channel if the person will but open up those channels by knowledge and faith, then directing the flow of that power by means of ideation and volition. As the ancient teaching states it, the individual may manifest the cosmic thought power in the degree that he recognizes and realizes the relation of his own thought power to it. The recognition and realization of the truth that the universe is alive, that livingness is the universal state, that the cosmos manifests will power and thought power, both in its totality and in its every part, that all power is will power, and that all will power is directed by thought brings as a natural consequence the ability to manifest the hidden forces of the cosmic thought power under the direction of the individual will and thought power. Demonstration must always be preceded by perception. Manifestation must be preceded by recognition and realization. You must know the truth before you are able to do the works. All thought power, the cosmic phase as well as the individual, is radioactive. The great centers of expression of the cosmic thought power are continually sending strong, powerful waves of force, energy and power in all directions, throughout all space. The individual instrument of thought power which has been carefully keyed and attuned to the wavelengths of the cosmic sending stations, is able to pick up the power thus radiated, as well as to listen into the messages from those great centers. Other individual instruments not so keyed and attuned are unable to avail themselves of the infinite energies and power of the cosmos which are open to the use of those properly attuned and keyed. We have here given you a hint at a mighty truth of a great principle which is known to those who have made a careful study of the subject. If you are wise, you will read and reread these statements both in the lines and between them, this to be followed by that conscious recognition and realization which must always precede the manifestation and demonstration of that truth. Commit to memory these three words, in the order above given, viz, 
I. Recognition. 2. Realization. 3. Manifestation. Then add the following dynamic aphorism. In the degree in which I recognize and realize the principle, in that same degree will I be able to manifest and demonstrate it. In that statement is contained an ancient occult secret of power. Those who are ready for it will find it revealed in the statement. Those who are not as yet ready will find that the statement merely serves to conceal the secret. There is a tremendous truth revealed, or concealed, as the case may be, in the ancient occult aphorism above quoted. It means, in its essential truth, that you are living and moving and having your being in a living universe of infinite power. It means that this infinite power is at your command, disposal, and direction, in the degree in which you are able truly and fully to recognize and realize the fact of its existence, your relation to it, and your power and ability to contact and draw to yourself its inherent energies, forces, and powers. The statement, in fact, is so tremendous that the average person fails to comprehend its inner and actual meaning and truth, and, instead, contents himself with passing it by as mere words, or else as but a symbolic or poetical figurative expression. If what we have said in this book will serve to hasten your recognition and realization of the tremendous facts of thought power, we shall be well satisfied. For as truly as night follows day, so will that perception and cognition be followed by your ability to manifest express, and demonstrate the principles involved. In conclusion, let us once more remind you of the great truth expressed in the master formula of attainment upon which the practical methods of this instruction are based. Here it is, stated in popular form committed to memory if you have not already done so, master formula of attainment you may have anything you want, provided that you, 1, know exactly what you want, 2, want it hard enough, 3, confidently expect to obtain it, 4, persistently determined to obtain it, and, 5, are willing to pay the price of its attainment.